Welcome to 20 Minutes. I'm Nadia Nakhil with you. And today we have with us Advocate of the Supreme Court, Heather Rahid. We have to speak about, um, um, you know, the principal secretary, former principal secretary, Azam Khan, giving statements. And the present government saying that Imran Khan seems to be in hot waters. How strong are these statements in the court of law as a former principal secretary of the former prime minister? How much of this is counted as a very solid witness against the cases that have been booked um, against Imran Khan? Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Heather. First of all, everyone was a bit surprised that a former principal secretary who just went missing suddenly has given a 164 statement in front of a magistrate and that statement is also leaked. How do you see this as part of the legal fraternity? Uh, well, thank you for having me, Nadia. Uh, it's interesting that the most uh, the fundamental uh, requirement for such a statement to be recorded and to be held admissible in evidence or to be given any credence at all is the concept uh, and the requirement of voluntariness. Uh, so as long as this statement has actually been made before a magistrate who signed off on it, and it was made voluntarily. This is the key word here. It has to be a voluntary statement. It cannot be a coerced statement. It can barely be a persuaded one. It has to be an absolutely uh, voluntary statement. Uh, if it is indeed a voluntary statement made before a magistrate who has signed off on it, because I've not seen it, maybe you have. Uh, but if it is exactly that, then certainly it is of some value. In as much as it, it might uh, not be conclusive, but if the uh, uh, the ancillary and corroborated evidence uh, were to support it, then indeed it can be seen as a confession statement. And if it is seen as a confession statement, then um, uh, Mr. Imran Khan or uh, Qasim's father could be added in this FIR as an accused. However, further along the way, when the trial proceeds, this magistrate who is said to have reported the statement under his supervision right. would be would act as a witness who would be cross-examined as to its veracity and credence. Oh. So uh, it is far from conclusive at this point, mm -hmm. but for it to for it to move forward with uh, any degree of credence, for it to become a valid piece of evidence to be considered. Right. It would have to be a, magist uh, a statement given before a magistrate uh, voluntarily. And okay. again, like I said, uh, he has to be alone with the magistrate. He cannot right. be the presence of a uh, policeman. Uh, mm -hmm. No statement given under custody can be given any credence at all. He okay. has to be given time for uh, reflection. Uh, there can't be any inordinate delay between the time that he was uh, missing or taken in custody and between that and the time when the statement was made before a magistrate. So there are lots of legal requirements to ensure that this confession is voluntary. Okay, so there are now so many questions. That's why I wanted to have you so that legally you could explain to us. So I'll start with my questions now. Now, on the face of it, a person who went missing and for days where you have an FIR registered in Islamabad and then you had Islamabad High Court saying where is he and he must be produced and then the statement. So do you really think that as a legal expert, do you think that this is not a statement, this is a voluntary, uh, voluntarily given statement? My first question would be where is the statement? I first want to see whether a magistrate signed off on it. Is the magistrate okay. putting it? I haven't seen okay. it, maybe you have. Okay. So we, we'd have to start from there, right? I mean, okay. unless, until we see that, there's no point proceeding further on any of this because that is the fundamental premise that this, in fact, has happened. Whether okay. it has happened voluntarily would be secondary to that. So first Where is question, the statement is the first question. So, so uh, any any such statement made by any man, any, anybody, you know, who, who wants to make this kind of a statement under 164, do you do you think that the confidentiality of this before the magistrate has to be maintained and it should have not been leaked to the media it's not about confidentiality once the statement is made it's part of the record it can be uh you, you know it, it is a, a written uh, down stamped piece of paper uh, which is part of the public record once it has been made before the magistrate and he signed off and stamped off on it. 
Now, like I said, I haven't seen that. Uh, assuming without conceding that there is such a statement, then we will proceed on to see the circumstantial evidence and okay. the evidence of that particular day and that particular time, whether it can be seen that this statement, if made, is indeed voluntary. Uh, okay. For which, like I said, you will have to look at whether he was alone with the magistrate, uh, wh whether there was any delay between the time he went missing and when the statement was made, whether there was any delay between the time he was arrested, if he was arrested, and when the statement was made, was he given time to reflect, uh, was he absolutely alone and free to say what he wanted before the magistrate, all of that's going to come into question. Okay, now for the case to proceed, let's say this is one thing. Uh, whatever statement a person makes, and in this case it's Azam Khan, former Principal Secretary of the former Prime Minister, he will have to repeat the statement again for it to be valid. Well, if the statement has been made, a co-accused is allowed to cross-examine it and even further down in the trial, uh, certainly there will be uh, the, the, the accused, let's say for example, if, if this statement is relied on and Mr. Right. Qasim's father is made as a co-accused in this FIR, given what uh, what Mr. Uh, Azam Khan has said may well constitute a criminal offence that uh, Qasim's father may have made, in which case he will be added as an accused and if he is added as, a, as an accused, he will have a chance to cross-examine Mr. Azam Khan as to what he has said, if he has indeed said this. So okay. yeah, he will not only have to repeat it, it will have to be proved in evidence, which has not happened even if all that is said about its veracity thus far is true. Oh, so the, you know, there's, this is a very, it, it's quite a process then. I mean, anybody cannot just come... Right, yeah, let me be clear, right now, the only way this is very relevant is that if indeed it is a statement made then it can lead to Qasim's father being added as a co-accused or an accused in this FIR and the criminal case against him in terms of violation of the Official Secrets Act uh, in relation to the cipher can then proceed. Okay. That can happen and if a statement like this has made, that probably will happen. Okay. But whether this document or whether, whether Mr. Azim Khan's statement is to, uh, tomorrow proven uh, to be correct, uh, that will only come out in evidence in the trial. It's too premature right now to comment on that. Right okay. now, the only thing we need to be concerned about is whether such a statement has actually been made before a magistrate. And if so, uh, does it then constitute the, uh, does it include uh, and talk about the elements of a crime that Qasim's father may have committed, in which case uh, the criminal case will then at least be initiated against him and then he'll go on to trial and then this document which is Azam Khan's uh, confession okay. statement will have to be proved All right. and, and okay. Mr. Mr. Qasim's father will have a chance to cross-examine it. Okay, now moving further, uh, you know, the present government has, has been saying that Azam Khan, the former principal secretary, has, you know, come to surface as an approval. So I would want to know what happens to the approver, like, um, you know, he, he may be part of the crime, for example. So is he like, let go or, or something, you know, he's given some kind of concession? Well, we don't know right now uh, whether he is going for a plea bargain or what is going on. This is stupid. Right now, it's all just very premature. Like I said, uh, the premise from which we will proceed, Nadia, is where is the state? We really can't, like, you know, we've talked about right to the end of where this can go and it can go. Hmm. But it's only going to go there if there is the statement, this confession and whether it has been procured uh, lawfully, whether uh, there is in fact a document that the magistrate is going to stand by, whether that document was in fact, uh, you know, put uh, down on paper as a consequence of a voluntary statement that met with the prerequisites that have to be met for such a statement to be considered voluntary. So there's, you know, plenty of slip between the cup and the lip. In fact, this isn't even really the cup and the lip. We don't even know where the cup is and where the lips are. Right? <laughs> okay. You see, we, we need to see the, the statement first, right? Yeah, How can we proceed further without looking at the statement? Because the first thing that has to be determined is whether Mr. Azam Khan is telling the truth or not. Well, you whether speak in so much, but you, have you seen the government presses? I mean, every, every minister is like celebrating, saying, Look, I, I happen to have a Taula Tarasan. He said it's an open and shut case. It's just going to take about 2 to 2.5 weeks. And this, maybe. This one, there's Look, going it, to be a wrap up. 
So it may be an open and shut case. All I'm saying is we don't know right now because we haven't seen the statement. Tomorrow, the statement will have to stand the scrutiny and the test of uh, being proven uh, through trial. But but before we come to that, let's see the statement. But whatever it is, it can well lead to the initiation of a important criminal prosecution against Tarsen's dad. That okay. may well. Yes. Okay. So so now where that you... will go, it's too mm-hmm. it's too soon to say where that will go. Okay, because uh, we we saw the law minister talking about uh, the official secret act. Now there seem the, the the legal fraternity seems to be a bit divided on this one. Like Hamid Khan, I spoke to him, and he said this does not come under the official secret act. Uh, and there was, you know, you when the government says that national security was compromised because of this cipher issue. Um, he, uh, in his opinion, there was no national, uh, you know, uh, security that was compromised, and hence uh, he says that you know when you go to the court of law and when this case is going to be proceeded, it's just going to be, str- uh, you know, it's going to be struck out on the basis that it was it does not come under the official secret act. What would you say on this? Does it come under that parameter or not? Taking a cipher. Well, as- well, he did wave that around and said as much as that the U.S. may have may well have been involved or been the uh, you know initiating uh, you know influencer in his removal from power, and that certainly can influence uh, to the detriment of our um, foreign uh, relations with the U.S. I mean, it could certainly affect our relations with the U.S. Whether they actually have done or not, uh, I don't know. But for uh, someone to use confidential information uh, to uh, further his political cause at the expense of our foreign policy and our relations with the, the probably the biggest superpower that the world has known in more than half a century is certainly something to be considered as borderline national security, if not absolutely a national security breach. Now he hasn't, uh, uh, you know. Uh, co- collaborated with any military personnel nor uh, directly uh, hit at any military installations with this breach. So uh, the military courts may well be out. But uh, I think a regular criminal prosecution uh, before a regular court of law under the Pakistan Penal Code may well lie. Uh, But that again will have to be seen after we see the statement uh, that the magistrate uh, is willing to stand by. And we will have to see that this confessionary statement of Azam Khan tomorrow, which will also need to be proven in in a court of law, which still hasn't been done, obviously, because we're not at that stage. But having said that, um, what whatever has been reported could well constitute uh, a criminal offence as far as uh, the ingredients of a, a certain crime are concerned. In which case, a criminal process can be initiated because of course this is Azam Khan's statement and even if given voluntarily of which there is plenty even of if, doubt. But even if we don't talk so, about the statement but the fact that former Prime Minister had taken the cipher and he himself has said on record that it's not with him. Uh, you know he did have it but it's you know well, just lost somewhere. So, so, so be, just taking a cipher, a classified document in public, uh, it, it is against the law right? Well, the Prime Minister in most jurisdictions has the power to declassify it as well. It is really the Prime Minister's decision as far as what uh, needs to be kept classified and, and what doesn't. But that has to follow a process which obviously didn't, uh, you know, in this case. But like I said, all of that is for much, much later. The first thing is that whatever Azam Khan is said to have said, can we take that at face value as something that he voluntarily said? Forget about whether it's true or not. We're not even there right now. We are, we're not even anywhere. We're country miles away from determining whether uh, what is reported is true or not. We're not. That's not even relevant right now. What's relevant is did he say it voluntarily? Because if he did, and it does constitute, uh, you know, uh, include the elements of a crime. Uh, under Pakistani law, then at least a criminal process can be initiated against Hassan's power. Okay. And, and, and what's the punishment like? If I believe it's 14 years or, or, or worse. Uh, I mean, it's a very serious uh, sentence. Okay. I mean, it, wouldn't, it, it, it is to a point where it's not really going to matter if it's 14 or 18 or 12. He's going to be out of politics for 
uh, you know, uh, as long as he would be for any crime that he would commit, uh, if he is to still keep uh, living. So uh, don't worry about what the, it's a it's a it's a heavy sentence. No, there I'll was have to look that you know the exactly. government also signaled, especially Rana Sanaula did that uh, you know the cabinet may think about Article Six also because the present government believes that the former prime minister had used this cipher to his political gains and and hence has compromised the national security and of course the foreign relations with the us well i don't know if how this can be extended to include a subjugation or uh, you know the violating uh, or just setting aside the constitution because Article 6 isn't just about violating laws or even violating the constitution. It's about uh, completely just like throwing it away kind of thing. So I'm not too sure if this would rise or extend to that level. If they want to proceed with that, they'll have the federal government's going to have to first authorize that uh, prosecution under Article 6. I, for one, think that this is all political rhetoric when it comes to Article 6. We've started taking uh you know article six to be just anything that you want to throw at politically at anyone hmm. um, having said that like if if this statement is correct uh i i do think that uh Qasim's father is, is going to face criminal prosecution because uh even on the face of what has happened it is quite clear that uh, political advantage was sought at the expense of uh you know our foreign relations and I think that might uh, well be enough for a prosecution to be initiated. But having said that, I, I want to see this magistrate stamped, signed document before we go anywhere. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Heather, for being with us. And you've really made this uh, you know, easy for us to understand how it becomes very important that first the statement has to be seen. Where is the statement? And uh, as Heather and whether it was voluntary, that's right. the key. Whether, that's and the when, you, when you say the time between, you know, yeah. the, you know, the arrest and then the statement, he not being there in the picture and then the statement, all of this, this is going to be looked at. Well, this is, we very, all, this is yeah. very right. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for giving your time. And as uh, let's say, as the case proceeds. We would like to have more of you on this for your legal uh, opinion.